corruption index. I, I remember when that corruption index thing was posted on the Digistan website, and I, I think I was the very first person to, to send an email immediately saying I found it offensive as well. I don't think it was a very appropriate um, statistic to be, to be drawing insinuations from. I also agree with the comment that um, we need to pressurize IBM to um, put their money where their mouth is and eat their dog food on this. Um, uh, but uh, coming to the, to the questions that come up, the fast track and the fact that the process was, 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 was really the wrong size for, for what was being pushed through it. Um, <clears throat> I think clearly that was the case. I don't, I don't think there's anybody afterwards who, who, who would really sit down and say, no, the fast track was the ideal way to push that thing through. Um, and I, I believe ISO is actually um, rethinking some of the processes, both around fast track and similar processes, such as the, the pass of public, uh, publicly available specification process. But I think one of the points that was really a cause of concern for me was that when, I don't people understand the way the fast track works, but, it, but ECMA, which is, a, which is a consortium, because ECMA enjoys a special status within ISO, a category A status. If a standard has been developed by ECMA, then they are, are automatically given the right to, to, to put that standard into what is known as this fast track process. The first step in that fast track process is the step to decide whether the process is appropriate for uh, this standards um, procedure. And I know certainly within South Africa we were being told we were not allowed at that point to prevent it progressing any further. I think that though the rules within ISO were perhaps not the best in the world, some of the rules that were there and are there weren't actually properly followed in this particular case. And in fact, that is why, there's one of the main grounds in which South Africa objected the process in the end. Um, in terms of how, how to effect reforms, I mean, it's all easy enough to sit here and reflect on, on um, um, uh, reforming the system. How to set about doing it, I think, to a large extent, it's got to be a, a, a um, issue of national reflection in different countries. I think certainly within South Africa, there's a lot of work that we can and should be doing working with our own South African Bureau of Standards to work together on improving processes within SABS and, and also um, working through SABS to, to um, get our voice heard within the ISO. I don't think, unfortunately, the ISO as it's currently constituted lends itself very well to, to voices coming from outside of those national bodies. And I think that's perhaps one of the problems of legitimacy that we're seeing now in the organization. Because if, if um, national bodies have such a, a, a diversity of legitimacy themselves, um, it's not always easy to see how those national bodies can always represent the interests of a country within, within the ISO. So yeah, fundamentally, I think anyone looking to seriously reform the ISO system has to start nationally. Um, Bob, I'll, I'll just ask you to maybe wrap your response up to that one there. And, yep. and maybe you want to respond to the Shuttleworth Foundation. That was the, that was the Shuttleworth yeah. Foundation. Okay. The, 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 the uh, last question was on, was on standards bodies and adoption, yeah. which perhaps uh, you might answer. Sorry, <laughs> I was just a bit distracted. Um, we've got approximately 10 minutes left. Um, so uh, there's, there's two things we could do. We could uh, give the panel a chance to uh, give final comments, or we could work a bit on recommendations that might come out of um, this particular session. Um, so we have written some of the things that have already been said. Um, we have had uh, lower the barriers to entry, remote participation, um, one vote per organization is a suggestion, uh, a consistent IPR policy, uh, policy royalty-free and open process. Um, and below that we've got uh, uh, the recommendations that we've had from Bob. So we could spend the next 10 minutes asking each panelist to um, to wrap up, or maybe we could have a discussion around the recommendations um, that have been made. Yeah, what, what I would actually quite like to do is, is, is to ask a question of, of the audience. Um, uh, we've heard some input from IBM, obviously. We've heard some input from Microsoft. 
We've heard some info, input from W3C. Are there, are there any other representatives here from, say, ITU or IETF um, who might want to make a comment um, on this? Okay, we have uh, two representatives. That uh, the work you do with open standards has a huge impact on human rights as much as it has impacts on, on many other areas that you may have uh, perhaps more familiarity with. Um, just to give you an example, uh, in the 1990s, uh, when we have the situations where companies were not uh, willing to develop software that was accept uh, accessible, uh, open communication protocols in, in email allowed me and many other people with disabilities to actually choose alternatives that were open and, and accessible, uh, uh, meaning the client software. And uh, what we have with closed protocols or closed, any kind of closed standards is a situation where you're completely uh, vulnerable to decisions and changes in strategy and you know, all kinds of variations that take place normally on the life of any company, but suddenly you have a large segment of the population that is completely vulnerable to those changes. So I just wanted to highlight the importance of the work you do and how much, uh, how much uh, mistakes or problems in the process of approving a new standard uh, can affect large segments of the population. So we are talking about 600 million people with disabilities across the world, and that's just the tip of the iceberg because everybody else here gets, uh, is affected by um, uh, problems with standard setting organs. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I think we have some uh, standards bodies. No. But we have, a, we have two hands, so maybe let's just quickly take the hands. Uh, I just had a comment about the recommendation. I can't, uh, I can't let it go through that the recommendation be that we not permit uh, uh, charging for the patents and standards. I agree personally, and Microsoft in general does not charge a fee. What we do sometimes is enter a standard where we need a third party's patent, and that third party's entire business model, this happens in the uh, in the communication device space all the time. Someone has developed a proprietary encoding technology. It's agreed internationally. It is the best way to accomplish that task. And that company says, that's fine. Then I need a tenth of a penny per unit in order to continue developing the next such innovation. This is the reason the patents uh, exist. This is the reason why they drive innovation to say that we require they not be in international standards means that certain international standards will be delayed by 20 years until the patent expires. And it is not obvious to me that's in the best interest of the international community. So a preference for no charge makes sense to me. But a requirement of no charge is a much harder case to make. All right. Uh, we have uh, another comment. Uh, yeah, Joseph Aldef with uh, Oracle. And uh, I'm not going to quibble about uh, IGF protocol and whether phrasing could have been done in a perhaps more polite manner. Um, but I do think the issue that was being raised is an important one, which is process transparency. And I don't really know that the recommendations get to process transparency as much as they might, because I think everyone benefits when they know the rules of the process and they're appropriately applied. So I think perhaps that also could be reflected. Okay, um, I'm not an expert in the process here, but I, maybe I can just help. I think the, uh, the purpose of this workshop that would then feed into the dynamic coalition on open standards, and hopefully we could then take this discussion online, and I think probably at the next IGF, we would have some sort of a position that we could take further. So the whole idea is really just to start discussion around it. I think um, the issue of uh, reform of standard bodies has become um, a serious issue for most countries and for most uh, users. And um, 
I think the Dynamic Coalition uh, really took some initiative to start the discussion around it. So in terms of adopting this document or adopting any of these recommendations or suggestions, is, is, it's not a blanket thing that will be adopted immediately uh, from this discussion, as far as I understand. No, but I'm not the process expert. But uh, hopefully uh, we can put the process, process here. I, yeah. I'm sorry, but the recommendations yeah. as written there, I object to them. And all okay, that. what you. I'll do is in the last minute, I'll ask um, uh, Thiru, who's been the comment around uh, their perspective. But I don't think we have the time uh, for a debate. So maybe what we want to do is just put, a, what, put, put recommendations up and then we can understand what the process is going forward from Tiro. So this is the recommendations I think that have come through so far. If there's anything... No, like these are the suggestions that have okay. come through. The recommendations okay. mean that okay. we have agreed to them. That one has not been agreed to. I say right. Suggestions? Oh, will, will, will that be okay? All right. So if we can just change recommendations to suggestions. We, are you talking about my recommendations? No, the ones that we've captured there and oh, yours. Okay. Because I, did, I didn't necessarily recommend so much. Yeah. You suggested. I said can, it must be clear. Must uh, be no, no, I don't think we have time for the debate because we're going to close up now. But uh, I think what we will do. Recommendation different from a suggestion. I think a recommendation is something that's more formally approved. Mm -hmm. No, but there's no approval on this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a recommendation. A recommendation. Uh, While well, Tiru's getting the mic, I'd just like to thank the panel. Um, I thank everyone. Um, I think Tiru will give you the resources that you need to go to to uh, participate further in this discussion online. Uh, and hopefully there's not much of a barrier to entry into that discussion. Thank you. Fruitful session. Just to let you know, um, there is a mailing list uh, for this dynamic coalition. Um, I'll get it to you uh, soon, but just for the record, if you're interested in signing on to it, um, you can email me and my email address, uh, I'll give it very slowly, is T-H-I-R-U at uh, KEIOnline.org, and I'll be happy to send you offline the uh, address for this dynamic coalition. And um, as Aslam said, these uh, suggestions are something this uh, group we'll discuss um, offline over the next year. And just as a reminder, um, yesterday there was a clarification from somebody who works at the IGF uh, Secretariat as to what exactly are dynamic coalitions. And just, it, it, they basically emanated, nobody actually can pinpoint the origins of them, but they just emanated just before or at the first IGF in Athens. And uh, to quote uh, Nitin Desai, um, dyma dynamic coalitions are an as just uh, an association of like-minded groups who agree to do something. That's what it is. OK, uh, I hope that's clear. Love to. <laughs> <laughs> adhering to what we are talking about. On the hardware front, uh, there is a whole lot of movement which also has to happen amongst hardware organizations. Uh, 